So good evening, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is our first Zoom webinar that we're doing for our new organisation, the Australian Friends of Ariel University. And quite obviously, our interest is introducing Ariel to the Australian Jewish community. We've got members on our board in both Melbourne and Sydney so far. And we want to develop relationships with other organizations. And in fact, you'll have seen that there are a number of organizations that are co-sponsors uh, tonight, um, including uh, Mizrahi and AJA and Friends of Likud and Kadima and Bene Akiva. And, um, and ultimately, we want to raise funds to support Ariel. Um, the, tonight, our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Gadi Hitman, and I'll give you a little bit of background about Gadi imminently. And he will be interviewed by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ron Weiser. Um, and I think all the Aussies will know Ron Bugatti in the possibility. Ron. Uh, Ron is a past president of the Zionist Federation, like myself, and we've worked together for many years. And he's one of the most effective community uh, volunteers that exists and very much appreciated in the Sydney community and in other places for all the work that he does. Um, I, I first visited Ariel several years ago with its uh, founder, and I found really an outstanding university. Uh, what excited me most about uh, Ariel was that it was clearly such a committed Zionist entity. Um, and I, I don't want to take the opportunity to take advantage and, and denigrate others, but it's, it's very straightforward at, at Ariel. Ariel is 100% uh, behind Medina Israel and all of Israel. And there's something special there that when you walk around Ariel, you see fantastic students. And one of the things that amazed me, it won't, it won't appeal to necessarily every person who's on tonight, but I, I saw students, dati and lo dati, religious, not religious. And when they walked out of the lectures, they put their hands up and they kissed the mezuzah. It was just an amazing experience. Uh, one of our um, members of the board, Paul Nayland, um, who's from Sydney, and he's gearing up the, the Sydney group, uh, just visited and wrote a fantastic report about what he'd seen there. And the experience, and, and Paul will say a few words afterwards, so I won't steal his thunder. But to give you a perspective of the size of the university, uh, and of course, Ariel is in the Shomron. It's the only university that's in your Dava Shomron. And it's increased its student body to 17,000 students. And it's got the highest number of Ethiopian students in Israel on a campus, as well as specific programs to integrate autistic students. It's got the second largest engineering school in Israel. It houses the first major medical center serving the entire region with a fully functional medical school and teaching hospital on campus. For those of you who don't know where Ariel is, it's sort of north of Tel Aviv and east of Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, it's a major city. Um, Ariel has developed groundbreaking research centers in numerous fields, including medicine, the environment, homeland security, Middle East studies, cybersecurity, and alternative energy. It has a unique R&D center, which has cultivate and revive ancient wines from 2000 year old DNA. And you'll be interested to know that we propose to do an event with these wines uh, sometime in the new year when we're all able to socialize together, separately of obviously Sydney and Melbourne. So now let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Gadi Hitman, who's a lecturer in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at Ariel University. And I could cite you all the articles that he's written and uh, 
but his field of research are the majority minority relationships with a specialization in Palestinian Israel Arab issues. An acclaimed published author and well respected academic has worked for almost 25 years as a senior researcher in the Prime Minister's Office Research Unit in Israel. So we're very honored, the Australian Friends of Ariel University, to host one of the most respected members of the talented academic team in the first of a series of international webinars. Now, I want to acknowledge Abigail, who can be seen on the screen and um, who's helping us at the Israel end. She lives in Kedumim. And I want to acknowledge uh, Ilana, um, who is based here in our uh, in Melbourne, who's done yeah. some of the uh, great work in preparation. So Paul was probably going to do it, but Ilana, Ilana Kingston, thank you very much. And now I'd like to hand over to Ron Weiser. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, let's go. Thank you very much, Danny. And um, Lisa, you deal. You'll probably remember that um, the last time I think I went to Ariel. You'll probably remember the last time I went to Ariel University was actually with you, um, and when we did a little tour around there. So I'd like to thank the members of the board, Paul, Danny, Tom, and uh, Harriet, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, firstly, to bring us uh, to hear uh, Gary Hitman, but also to allow me the privilege of uh, at least asking some of the questions that we'll discuss after his presentation. So without any further ado, Dr. Gary Hitman. Where's Gary? Gary? Oh, he's on mute. No, it's okay. Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, and good evening uh, to the Australian uh, community, Jewish community. Uh, today, it's, it's obviously, it's morning here in Israel. Lovely weather of between summer and spring. We are still waiting for the winter. It's a very pleasure for, and honor for, for me to be uh, with you this morning. And I, I was talking with, with Juan yesterday and two days ago with Ilana, trying to understand exact, exactly what what the people wants to hear. And Ilana, uh, she, she, she kept telling me all the time, don't talk history, talk about politics and talks about current events as it happens now in Israel. Uh, but you cannot explain the, 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 the story of Ram, uh, which is the first Arab party within the Israeli coalition ever since 1948 without two or three minutes about history. I won't be, I won't be long here, but I have to tell something that everybody understands immediately. We are talking basically about three, uh, 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 three or maybe even four different generations. We are talking about the subject generation after the war in 1948. We are talking about the erect one after 1967, between 1967 to 90. 93, perhaps until 2000. And then the last two decades, we are talking about a very, very insolent by meaning of rude generation of young Arabs, which most of them are today young people, more than 60% of the Israeli Arab minority are under the age of 24. So you can imagine demographically and other aspects of the future, what is, is coming, what is expecting us as, 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 as challenges. Uh, now, uh, let me just, put it like this, I think now it's better. Okay, uh, when we speak about majority minority relationship in Israel, whether you belong to the right side, right wing of the, of the political map or the left one, you always have to remember three things. We are always moving in a triangle of nationalism, religion, and civil affairs. Surprisingly, when it comes to religion, uh, Arabs, or let's say Jews and non-Jews are uh, uh, can set some uh, kind of regulations since 1948. Uh, the Jews are getting married, uh, getting bored, uh, getting registered in the Jews in the, what we call the Ministry of Interior. Uh, Muslim and Christians are making their weddings or their funerals upon their religions. So basically there are hardly any problems when it comes to religion, and unless we talk about the Islamic movement and Trump, which will come later on. 
The second issue that is probably the most problematic one is issue we have we are in a conflict or maybe some of some of the scholars who say that we are in intractable conflict, but some of them say they are saying that it, there is there are some kinds of uh, solutions that might be uh, come uh, maybe in the future, but. No, no question that we are in a national, ethno-national conflict between Jews and non-Jews in what we call Eretz Israel or the land of Israel. And the last one, which is the most flexible one, is the civil affairs. And here, here is the main issue of the story of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the person that you see in the, on the screen now, uh, Mansour Abbas, uh, the, 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 leader, uh, the leader of Iran. And this is just, just for the beginning. So just, just a, a very, very short history, you see those people, the old senior people of the Arab Israeli after 1948, which is what, what was left after most of them left or had to leave by the, uh, the consequences of the war in 1948. I'm not going to uh, get into too, uh, many details over here because of a uh, lack of time. Uh, and we are talking, of course, about the, 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 ministry, the military administration between 1948 to 1966, which is a, a, a tremendous uh, ramifications on the Arab minority ever since. In the, at least in the, the first two decades after the establishment, the establishment of the Israeli, uh, the, the Israel state, the state of Israel, and naturally some of the scholars will say, if you read them in Arabic as well as in English, that those ramifications are still here even today, remains in the third or in the fourth uh, generation. This is basically what we can say after 1967. On the left side of the screen, you can see what we call the, the son of the village. This is Bnei Akfar which was a secular movement who adopted the ideology of the PFLP, the Popular Front Liberation of Palestine of George Habash, meaning that we have to release all Palestine by, by armed struggle and we are not, uh, we have, there is no chance that we ever can uh, agree on the existence of the Zionist entity on, on, on Palestine. On the right side of the slide, you can see the person with the glasses. This is Sheikh Abdallah Nimer Darwish. Abdallah Nimr Dawish is the founder of the Islamic movement in Israel, which is the hard core of our uh, meeting today. He was born in 1948 in a, in, in, a, in a small village by the name of Kfar Qasem. I believe some of you heard about the massacre that occurred in Kfar Qasem in 1956. Kfar Qasem is in between Tel Aviv and Ariel, in between in the middle, that's about, let's say, 20 kilometers uh, northeastern from Tel Aviv and about 20 kilometers from Ariel, so it's in between. And he's the founder of the Islamic movement. And, the, and what you see uh, on, on, on the right side of the, of the slide, behind, uh, behind, uh, uh, under uh, uh, the picture of Abdallah uh, al uh, is of course the, the, the MK of, of Ram party uh, today. So I'm moving forward with your permission. This is of course, just a few uh, uh, memories of the land day of 1976 to to demonstrate to, to, to the people who are participating in this uh, event today, that it was basically the first national and civil conflict between Jews and non-Jews on what we call the land of Israel. National because we, Israel has been confiscated land from both Jews and Arabs since 1948 in order to establish public institutions for all uh, its population, mainly for Jews, but also for Arabs and civil because the land used the Arabs for agriculture and once you take the land by force because you are the, uh, you are the, uh, you are the state, you are the sovereign power uh, and they, they, they objected it very harshly, very hard in 1976. Six people, six Arab people were killed on that land of day on March 30, 30 uh, 1976 and ever, ever since every March 30, they commemorate the day of 1976. Just a, just a few pictures of, 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 of the press by that time of 1976. And this is the only slide that I'm going to talk about, something about the Israeli policy, which is very important to our, to our conversation today. Itzhak Shamir, who everybody can see here above on, this, on the left side uh, of, of the slide, is the first person ever in Israel that decided to change the, the policy rega, uh, relating to the Israeli Arab minorities. Between 1948 to 1990, most of the, 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 the policy was based on security issues. 
everybody, including Mapai and Mifleget Avod and and the Labour Party and and and, and even Menachem Begin of the Likud, everybody believed at that time that the Arab minority is, in Israel is first and foremost a security th potential threat to Israel. There might be a fifth column whenever Israel would be in a state in, war, in a state of a war with Arab states uh, among Israel, and those Arabs who lived in Israel were raised from, be, from, from the inside to, to challenge us. By the way, something that ne would never happen since 1948. But Ishak Shamir changed the policy from security one to security civil one. Uh, after convincing by his uh, advisors, uh, some of them are very well uh, known uh, public figures in Israel, people like Moshe Arens, <clears throat> and Dan Meridor, and Ronnie Milo, and Ehud Olmert, and others, that we have to do something in order to change the attitude uh, uh, relating to, uh, to the minority. Uh, Itzhak Rabin in 1992 continued that line based uh, uh, politically on five uh, Arab MKs who supported him from outside the coalition on depending that he will uh, promote any kind of political solution with the Palestinian, which he basically did in, in Oslo Accord. And surprisingly, Benjamin Netanyahu after, after he was elected in 1996, continued this policy of civil security uh, uh, mixed uh, policy, trying to promote civil affairs for an uh, uh, Arab uh, uh, minority in Israel. Uh, uh, what you see on, 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 on the uh, uh, downside of the slide is three Arab very important people. On, this, on the left, it's Shauki Khatib. Shauki Khatib was by that time the the head, the chair of the uh, the high up uh, monitor committee of the Israeli Arabs, which was based in 19, which was established in 1982, and in 1995, a short time before Rabin was assassinated, he said, "This is the golden era of the Arabs. We have never felt that we are equal like Jews uh, before, and now in 1995, we are. We see that things are, are starting to move in the favor of the Arab states. Contradictory, contradictly to to, to Shauki Khatib." Asmi Pshara, which is the head of Balad party, I'm not going to tell you to talk about Balad today, and the, uh, and the person uh, with, with, with the hand in, in, the, in the right side, this is Sheikh Raid Salah. Those, those two figures were objected, or, or still object, the existence of the Zionist entity in Israel. Asmi Balad is a Christian, an Orthodox one from Nazareth, and he believes in, in all citizen states. This is the main ideology of Balad. But the most important thing for our, most relevant thing for our uh, presentation now is Sheikh Raid Salah, which is, uh, uh, belongs to the Islamic movement. The tea, uh, the, 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 there's another different, totally different vision. This is just to remind you what happened to uh, 21 years ago in 2000 October events, and I'll connect it later to 2021 uh, riots which happened, which occurred in the Arab minority big cities uh, six months ago. And now I'm coming to the, to the hardcore of the presentation about Ram. There is no other way to say it. Ram is a religious party. It was, it was founded in 1972 by Sheikh Abdallah Nimir Darwish. And the fact that Ram become, became a, a constant member in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, ever since 1996 up today, is because the internal split within the Islamic movement that occurred before the general election of 1996, which Netanyahu won eventually after prevailing Paris. We cannot understand what Mansour Abbas is doing today without understanding his religious conceptions. The Islamic movement in Israel is an offshoot of the Muslim brothers of Hassan al-Banna which was formed in Egypt in 1928. There is no other way to define it. This is the only way, as I can understand, to see it. They believe in understanding, they believe in trust, they believe in brotherhood, you can see the slide. They believe in perseverance, in obedience, in sacrifice, in effort, which is jihad basically in, in Arabic, effort, action, sincerity. And this is the whole comprehensiveness of being a Muslim brother activist. This is the this is the Torah. This is the this is the foundation that Mansour Abbas, a dentist from a, 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 a small village in the north of Israel by the name of Mara, was was uh, was educated on. And you can see on the right side of the slide uh, the, the spread of the Islamic movement 
all over uh, uh, the Middle East. Now, when I'm saying Islamic movement, I'm talking about a cal an Islamic caliphate all over the region. And that includes also Israel. Now, you, you may ask me, and it's all absolutely legitimate to ask if, if, if this is the story and, or if this is the vision, how come we are working together with Mansour Abbas? Well, Mansour Abbas did something very cleverly. He, he still declares on himself as a religious person, but he chooses to go to one of the most important uh, streams within the Islam, which call in Arabic the Wasatiya. That means it, we are going in between. We are religious. We want the caliphate. You see the picture behind. You see the green, the green color on, on, on the map. This is the Islamic caliphate back to the 7th and 8th century. That's about 1300 years ago. You see from Spain on the west to China on, on, on the east. This is the look how, how, how big it was. And if you ask today, somebody from the Islamic movement in Israel, including within the Ram party, what is your vision? He will, he will say, this is my vision. This is what I want. I want an Islamic caliphate boy, based on the Islamic law, which he calls in Arabic the Sharia. I put only a, a few examples above here to see what is the Islamic law in society, Sharia politics, Sharia compliant, and so forth. This is the, this is the, this is the story. And now I'm coming here to this one. This is Islamic movement in Israel, which was split in 1996. On the right, Sheikh Raid Salah perfectly believed at that time and believes up today that Israel has no right to exist an Islamic caliphate and all over Palestine, including within what we call the Green Line, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Jerusalem, etc., etc., should be Islamic. Jews can be live here and they be what we call a status, a status B and not status A citizenship, they will have to pay taxes to the caliph, to the, to the ruler upon, upon the, Islamic, uh, the Islamic law, the Sharia. And we're not going to kill no Jews and not Christians. Why? Because both Jews and Christians have holy book, which is the Torah, the Bible, or the, or the, uh, the New Testimony. For, uh, for us as Muslims, that's okay, they can stay here, but the, the, the rule must be an Islamic one. On the contrary, Mansour Abbas, which believes exactly in what Sheikh Raid Salah believes, distinguished himself by choosing the civil, the civil pass. And the civil pass came six years ago. What you see here is a coalition of an Arab parties the joint list which were formed in 2014, just before the general election of 2015. What happened at that time? Four, four uh, very important developments which still relevant up to date. First, the raising of the blocking percentage to the Knesset. It was a, an initiative of, of Victor Lieberman. I, be, I believe some of them, some of you know, know who is uh, Victor Lieberman. And he, he, he passed a law bill that raised the threshold be from two to 3.25 percent to be elected to the Knesset. That makes the Arab, that made at that time the Arab parties in a situation that they realized that there is a good chance that none of them will pass this threshold. So they combined politically to run together to the Knesset in 2015. The second issue that happened at that time was that many, many young Arabs wrote over the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and elsewhere, how, how, how much they are disappointed by the fact that their leaders in the Knesset are not working for them. Instead of taking care to the Israeli Arab minority population, they are uh, basically, most of the time, are busy with promoting their personal interests. And uh, Arab and uh, uh, members at that time were pretty uh, well uh, uh, were pretty well aware of the situation that the Arab voters will not go to the ballot to vote for them for the, uh, in 2015. The third thing that happened at that time is that the Arab the Arab population and again basically the young one between uh, the ages of 18 and 34, 35 demanded from the uh, uh, leaders, the Arab leaders, people like Ayman Uda and Ahmad Tibi and Mansour Abbas and others, that stop talking about the Palestinian issue. We are all Arabs. Some of us are identifying, are, are, are identifying themselves as Palestinians, but what we basically want is 
from you is to take care of our civil affairs. And the fourth thing that happened at that time is that those Arab MK uh, or, or, or uh, 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 contenders to the Knesset believe that if they run together, they can uh, first pass the threshold and second confront, uh, 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 consolidate a, a, a pact or a political alliance that can challenge better the threats of the right wing uh, policy of, uh, uh, of, the, of the government. Now, if you go back to the last five years and you check, okay, so what happened in the Knesset between 2015 to 2019 until we entered into the first time elections in two years recently? You see something amazing. You see that in one Arab joint list, you saw Islamist, you saw communist, you saw nationalist, and they all were together on civil affairs. They have submitted to the Knesset 700 law bills in four years time, and they did it like the, the, and the party petition was very clear. Four of those 700, only four was on national affairs. 696 was on civil affairs. And you know what they did to promote it? They were together with Zionist parties. They went to the Haredim, the ultra old Orthodox. They went to the to the to the Likud. They went to the, 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 the to Meretz and other parties, trying to promote civil affairs, convincing them that if we promote such a low bill. It would be for the beneficial, not only for Arabs, but only, but also for, for Jews. And it worked. It worked perfectly. So what happened now, after four years of success in the Knesset, Mansour Abbas believed that they can do alone anything. Uh, it's like the, old story, the, 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 the famous old uh, English song, anything we can, you can do, I can do better. And he told them, anything we can do together, I can do better by myself. And he decided two years ago to split the joint Arab list into two, diff, uh, two, two Arab forces. He decided to run by himself to the Knesset and he cut himself from the joint Arab list. And immediately, immediately the, 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 the outcome in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the mandate was, was appeared. appeared. They, they dropped from 13 to 10 and in, on April 19. One month later, they realized that if they want to survive politically, they have to run together again, which they did, and they rise again from 10 to 15. And then Mansour Abbas decided again that he doesn't want to work with them, so he split it again. And the outcome now was that the joint Arab list has six seats in the parliament, and Mansour Abbas has <laughs> only four. But he passed the threshold as he is in the Knesset, and not that he, not only that he's in the Knesset, he is the balance, he, he can play with the balance of power between the coalition and the non-coalition. Why did it happen? It happened because of two things. One, because Benjamin Netanyahu made the Arab parties in Israel kosher for a coalition, realizing that he has no ability to form a coalition without Mansour Abbas or the joint Arab list. He started calling himself Abu Yair. Once you call yourself Abu Yair, you made the Arab parties kosher. Now, if the Likud is making, the leader of the Likud, is making kosher the Arab parties to enter the, the, the coalition and, 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 and cooperate mainly on civil affairs, once you, the, the, your mandate to establish a, a, a government is expired by the president and, and Naftali Bennett has it, nobody can say now to Naftali Bennett, you are, you are not allowed to go with them. You, that, 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 this is one thing that happened. The second thing that happened, it does not connect in any form to Arabs. The fact that Netanyahu was, uh, uh, was rejected by so many uh, uh, Jews leaders, such as Naftali Bennett, Avigdor Lieberman, Gidon Saar, and Benny Gantz, and the fact that they have only 57 seats and they needed 61, made no, pass, no, no other option for them to take Mansour Abbas, which of course, which I said earlier, that Netanyahu already made him kosher. So the situation, the situation that we have today is that we have a, a, an Arab party within the coalition for the first time. It's hard. People, many people in Israel are, uh, have difficulties to digest it, but this is what we have. And not surprisingly, ever since they were sworn the Knesset on June 13, it's now five and a half months, they are, work, they are working basically on civil affairs. Now, I would like to finish my 20 minutes 
by saying this. We had a crash on May because we saw Arabs taking out the streets in mixed, mainly in mixed cities, such as uh, Lod, Jaffa, uh, Haifa, and, uh, and Akko, trying to, uh, to hurt Jews or Jews' uh, 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 business stores, uh, synagogues, uh, uh, and so on. Why did it happen now? And where, where does it put Ram trying to, to, to mediate between the, the young Arabs who took the streets and the Israeli government because they know that they can they have to to facilitate the or, or to desk to de-escalate the situation on the ground. We had so look at look at the, look, just to take a, 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 a quick glance on, on on this slide. We had so many opportunities to see Arabs on the streets or national first in the last two decades. We had defensive shields in Jenin refugee camp almost 20 years ago. We had casket operation, then pillar of clouds and so on and so on. And they didn't, took, they didn't take out the streets. And the same, same thing is about religious. So why now? Why now in May, 2021? What happened now that changed the ball game between Jews and Arabs on the streets? I can give, if, if you ask, if you want it, I can talk about it in another presentation, but the situation on the ground was very simple. But Suh Abbas was the first Arab leader who came to Lod, where a synagogue was burned by Arabs, and he denounced it, realizing that if somebody is, take it, is set on fire today, a synagogue, tomorrow it will be a, a church or a mosque. And ever since he's walking on the ground with these young people to de-escalate the situation. I'm not telling you here today that such an event that happened in May cannot be reoccurred. It can be, it can happen in the future again. But the, the fact is that Mansour Abbas is pretty aware, uh, he knows very well that he has one bullet in his gun. And if he's not taking out the bullet now, trying to promote civil affairs for our situation, for our population, in the next time when we go to elect our uh, representatives to the Knesset, there is, a, there is probably slightly a good chance that he is not passing the threshold. Some pictures that from, from the last uh, riots of May, and where, where does he put it? Put us to the future, and by that I'm finishing. Our politicians became legitimate partners. From now on, every time, every one of us will be a candidate to form a new government in Israel, has the privilege to discuss with our politicians about a potential future coalition with them in order to promote Civil affairs, as you see the triangle of my, the beginning of my presentation on civil affairs. The continuation of civil integration is, is fantastic within the Arab sector. I just finished another research with one of my uh, colleagues and we find out that ever since uh, the army, the Israeli, the IDF army was involved in helping uh, Arabs during the Corona pandemic, the numbers of Arab, young Arabs who wanted to enlist the police or the army has increased and multiplied itself by hundreds because they feel that they want to be part of the, of the, of the states, of the civil society, and they want to serve their states. They are not recognized the, the character of the Jewish state, but they say that, but, but they, they keep saying at that time, this is my country as well, and I want to serve my country. Mansour Abbas, and probably other Arab MK will try to promote civil affairs. That's obviously it's infrastructure, housing, raising the rates of, of working women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Defeating, of course, the crime level of crimes of crime is, is, is high in the Arab sector. And they always keep moving in the internal, probably unresolved conflict of civil affairs and a potential escalation in the Palestinian arena. And if you ask me, probably one of the of you are going is going to ask me in, uh, when we come to the Q and A. So I'm, I'm I'm telling right now, if Israel finds itself in a situation that he had to do a military operation, a wide military operation in uh, in Gaza in order to uh, decrease terror uh, uh, rates, if you ask me, Mansour Abbas will not quit from the government. He he will swallow this situation realizing that he has to stay within the guy I'm finishing. He has to say, somebody is too. Uh, would I be afraid? Uh, 
is, is here to stay because he wants to come to his voters in 2023 or 2024, who knows when, and uh, present achievements, basically civil achievements. Success or failure of Ansur Abbas depends basically on political developments within the Israeli political national arena. It's not only just the, men, the question of Arabs, it's also a question of how strong or how, how long this, this fragile uh, coalition uh, uh, will survive. And so far, I think that they are realizing that it's better for them to work together and be, uh, instead of being hanging on the wall one, one, one next to each other. And, and, and obviously, if Mansour Abbas will succeed, if he succeed, other uh, uh, Arab uh, uh, fig public figures who are dreaming about being one day a, a, a member of Knesset try to imitate him. That's obviously, because if, if, he, if he brings achievements, he will be the pioneer in front of the camp. So this is basically what I wanted to talk to. I hope, it, I hope first of all, I hope that this is what you all wanted to, to hear. I try to skip as much as I can, as, as, far as, as much as I could from history. And I, I, I'm, I'm apologize for my, my, poor, my poor English. Danny, I'm not living in Melbourne or Sydney, so I apologize for my, my poor English, but at least I did the best as I can. And now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Adi. Um, that, that was a good overview of the whole uh, situation. Um, so, I'll start with my first question. Uh, you seem very excited about Mansour Abbas's inclusion. It's a watershed moment. It's changed. I mean, is he going to stick just to the civil agenda or is uh, the accusation that he's a Trojan horse, does that have any validity in your mind? Um, and um, perhaps we'll start off with that. And I'll remind people that if you want to ask a question, you can please put it into the chat and we'll try and get to all the questions as we go along. But if you can just start off with that, you know, um, is he is he a Trojan horse, or is this a is the Muslim Brotherhood um, questions in the background, and everything else is going to be focused always on the civil question? You asked me yesterday to be short in my answers, so I give you one sentence that includes all the issue. Ideologically, okay. ideologically, is a Trojan horse. Practically, is not. Now, the, 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 the Israeli establishment success to decrease the potential Trojan horse depends in our, in our strengths. If we, the Jews, know how to be strengths vis-a-vis -vis the Arabs uh, as, as a minority and Ram particularly, then we can decrease it. But it depends on what we do now with him. If they feel that they are equal partners with us in promoting civil affairs, it will be work for the benefits of Israel. You speak, I know that you know Hebrew, so I can tell you in one sentence in Hebrew, you, you immediately understand it. It's, this is the difference between, we call Danny, Danny knows Hebrew as well. This is the difference between what we call Hibuk Tov, when you love somebody, you want to give him a big hug, and Hibuk Dov, which when you want to remove some, some, somebody for yourself. So it's, it's a very good title for a book in Hebrew, Hibuk Tov and Hibuk Dov. But this is basically what we have to do. And don't forget one thing, Juan. The power is in our hand. And we should know how to handle it vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the our minority, OK? So ideologically, the answer is yes. Practically, I'm not sure. OK, thank you. So the first thing he achieved, which is something nobody has achieved till now, is the budget. He got 10 billion US dollars over five years. The three areas that he wanted to address, which was crime, infrastructure, and the unauthorized Bedouin towns, he achieved all of that. He's teacher, he's the smallest party in the Knesset. He leads the smallest party in the Knesset. He's teetering on the brink of the threshold. How will Israeli Arabs view these achievements? And are they, is this going to be viewed as an achievement by his or as a sellout? Since we speak today, it's November 25th, I can tell you that it's, it's, a, very, it's a very clear clear picture that we can see. Whenever it comes to the, to, 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 he's going to his people on the ground, to, to the Arab cities, most of the people perceive Mansour Abbas as a traitor. You're working with the Zionist. 
How dare you to betray us? You are a religious person. You belong to the Muslim brother ideology. How dare you work with the Zionist? The, the, the test will be on, on the time to see what he's bringing with him. That's okay to approve the budget, but it's not enough to approve the budget. The budget should be implemented on the field. And once they see change, just as Shauki Khatib has had seen in 1995, when he stated this is the golden era of the arms in Israel, if they see the change, there is a, there is a potential that they change their attitude to Mansour Abbas. On the other end, we are speaking on Mansour Abbas and Ram today. What happened to the joint Arab list in the opposition? They are not bringing achievement as well. So we can talk all, every day on the TV. We can write in Arabic on our platforms every day. We want to do this. And we want, to, we want to, to, to improve this and so on and so on. But the, at the end of the day, eventually people ask, what did you do for us? You were sitting there for four years, hopefully for them for four years. What did you achieve for us? And, the, and that's the reason that Mansour Abbas realizes very well that he has only one chance. So passing the budget, it's a first step, very important one. Now we have to see things happening on the ground. Electricity, sewage, infrastructures, uh, daycare for children, uh, education for uh, uh, computers in the education uh, uh, in every school and so on and so on. I can, I can give you a, a huge list here, but okay. we, are, we, are, we are short of time. So maybe, maybe if we have another meeting in one year from today, and we sit on November 25 or 24th, no, November 25, 2022 will be Friday, so we cannot make it on Friday. But let's say in the year from now, we can sit together here and Danny will still be his work is in the, in the, as a dentist. We can see, okay, it's now, a year has passed away. What did Mansour Abbas really uh, uh, did uh, or try, what, what, what did he achieve? What did he achieve like, in last year? So far, it, it, it's too early to, to evaluate, but he's working. Okay. And he's hiding, and he's hiding his religious and national aspirations. He's hiding it. Okay, I want to go back to a question that you actually started to address in your talk, and if you can just expand a little bit on that. Um, how does having an Israeli... You said that if there was action in Gaza, you believe Mansour Abbas would stay with the government, and that means to support the government. Uh, <clears throat> can you just expand on that and whether there's a difference between Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas? in terms of what the reaction might be? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I'm working nowadays on, on, a new, on a new study, trying to, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sharing here with you my thoughts from last day. I'm, I'm, I'm working about the question, whether ever the pan-Arabism idea of, Gamana, of Nasser, the, the, the former uh, Egypt, Egyptian president, had a chance to make all the Arab united together. And you see something amazing. They never had the chance. It's a dream that never, come, never, never comes true. And, and there are so many reasons to explain why. But so Abbas, for him, when he look on the, when he's, when he, when he's wake up in the morning, he's watching on the Kinneret, and he's looking to the north and he see Jenin and Nablus and Ramallah and elsewhere, he says, he's not the only one who says to himself in his heart, I am an Arab, they are Arab. I am a Muslim, they are Muslims. I'm a Palestinian, they are Palestinians, but I'm different. I am an Israeli citizen. And now I have to ask myself one very simple question. What, 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 what am I asking for myself and for my people? And who are my people? If Israel attacks Iran, or Iran attacks Israel, if Israel attacks Hamas, or Hamas attacks Israel, and same thing about Hezbollah, I'm not the game changer here. What I can do to be a game changer is to promote the, 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 my, my people. And it's like, it's like written in the Talmud, you know what is an Yeh I'm not, I, I don't need to, Danny say, Danny say, yes, he said. I'm not, I, I don't need to translate it even to English, but your, your people is before everybody else. That's okay to be Palestinian. That's okay to dream about a, a, a political solution, two-state solution, three-state solution, eight-state solution, it doesn't matter. But nobody will take care to the Israel Arabs here unless I do it. By the way, the history has proven us because Ilana didn't want to talk about history, but history has shown us very important things. Who really took 
care for the Israeli Arab minority since 1948 up to today. Who? Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, PLO, Abu Mazen, Arafat, Hamas, none of them. They are here, they, they are here. Some will say, unfortunately, they are, they are here to stay forever. Some others will say, okay, they are here, we have to, to, to collaborate with them. Let's see what we can do. By the way, promoting Arab civil affairs is not only for them, Ron. It's only for the, for the Jewish interest. It's a Jewish no. interest, if you ask me. That's an interest, it's also, this is a national interest. Do we sure. really want to leave them behind us? So before, okay, so before we move to the questions in the chat, my last question. I mean, you said that giving them all of the civil rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, can work as long as we retain the power effectively. And we retain the power in a democracy by, you know, having 80% or whatever percentage of the population, exactly this, 79%. Does that have any implications for how you see arrangements in uh, Yudav Shamron, Judea and Samaria? Wow. Wow. That's a political question. This is, a, it's not up to Mansour Abbas or Ram. It depends on Naftali Bennett. No, but in the shaping of the Israeli attitude to what to do. I, I can tell you something. I can tell you something about your Davish and the Israeli settlement and the Jewish settlement in Davish yeah. like this. Ever since Yasser Arafat has passed away in November 11, 2004, it's now 17 years. Nobody, no one all over the globe, including the United States, the EU, the Quartet, Russia, Arab Gulf states, the Maghreb, and another, nobody really stopped us from doing two things in Yudav Shimon. One was to, was to prevent security threats. You, you can namely terror against Jews. Every time when we identify a terror threat, we try to uh, thwart it. And or we do it by itself, or we pass the information to Abu Mazen security forces and he's doing the work, the job for us. By the way, it's also for him, not only for us. Oh. And the other issue is that no one ever in the world really stopped us from building in the territories. If we want to expand Jewish settlement in the territories, the Yudav Shamon, nobody really stopped us since Yasser Arafat has passed away. Even, even John Kerry, when he asked Benjamin Netanyahu to halt the the building from nine months, it was Netanyahu's decision as a goodwill and not more than that. Now, if Naftali Bennett or Zev Elkin or Gideon Saar or other politicians wants tomorrow morning to expand the Israeli Jewish settlement, and just on the excuse of demography, okay? Nobody really stopped them, not even Mansour Abbas. We can do it if you want to do it. The question, and it's not to me, why we are not doing it? Or right. why we are not doing it enough? Right. That's the question. This is a political one. This is not, there is, you really think that an Arab young from Jaffa or Haifa wake up, wakes up in the morning and he said to me, you know, I know a guy, a very nice guy from Australia. His name is Dr. Onweiser. He's all day, he's keeping mind busy. What will happen in Israel if Hasme Khalila will expand our, our settlements in territory? This is not the issue. They, are, they wake up in the morning, they go to work, they have mortgage. Most of them are, most of the day, are dealing with them. You know what is that? You know what is that? They are here most of the day. Seriously, you have to come. When you come to Israel, make me a promise, be my guest. All right, thank you. And Danny as well. I'll tell everybody is invited, of course. I'll take you to an Arab cities and villages. See how, what they wear, what they eat, how they talk. What are their inspirations? You Davish and one? This is a political question. This is for yeah, Bennett, no. not for me. Okay, very good. We'll ask Naftali Bennett that question, why he doesn't do more. You want, uh, to call him? You want, you want the telephone number of Naftali Bennett? I can give you. We, we heard him on Sunday night. Ah, you actually. have it. So you're done. <laughs> you set up. No problem. Um, uh, the first question is from David Adler. He asked, there's a video of a moment silence in the Knesset to honor the victim of terror, Ellie K. All of the members of the Knesset are standing except for Abbas. What does that say about his attitude to terrorism and Hamas? I, it was a, I can hardly hear you. Can you repeat it, please? You, you okay, can there see was a tech, There was a techist in the uh, Knesset uh, in honor of the victim of terror who was killed in the old city, Ellie Kay. And the members of the Knesset were standing, but Abbas wasn't. 
what does this say about his attitude to terrorism and to Hamas? You did not, you did not hear one word from any Arab MK after the event in Jerusalem. And you should not be surprised by that. This is what you saw on my, on my presentation. This is the constant tension. When, when, when should I say something? And when should it be silence? Obviously, we as a Jew, we expect him, by the way, not only Abbas, Babu Mazen, Ayman Uda, and, and others, to, to condemn terror attacks. But why should he? Why should he? If he believes that a, a caliphate, an Islamic caliphate should be one day, and one Jew, unfortunately, was, was murdered by an Arab, why should, why should he denounce it publicly? He can tell you on Cos Cafe, when you have a cup of coffee in a restaurant, listen, Ron, that, that's not my pattern of activity. I'm not, the, the, but it can hurt him politically. So we prefer to remain silent. To tell you in his heart that he is really sorry for that, I'm not sure at all. I'm not sure at all. I didn't talk, I didn't speak with him, but the fact that they remain silent speaks for itself. Okay. So um, there's a question here asking, did Jews vote for Arab parties at all? And if, what, if so, what sort of Jews would vote for Arab parties? Oh, wow, wow, wow. First of all, the answer is yes. And it happens basically because there are Jewish people in Israel who, are, who, who, who speaks Hebrew or understands Hebrew less than you do. Therefore, when you go to the to the vote, to, to, to vote, they, they just, they, they mixed up the, 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 the notes and they don't know what they, what they took. If, so if they see something that looks okay for them and it can be an Arab one, they put it in the, they put it in the box. The answer is yes. Two, there are people, Israeli, Zionist people, voting for our parties because they really believe ideologically that the best way to promote the civil affairs is uh, with participation. And the only party, who, who, or the only parties, except merits, who are talking about participation is our parties, our parties. So they vote for them. How many? I didn't check. All right, but I want to be fully, I want to be fully honest with you. I, okay. I can check it, but I didn't so far. Okay. By the same token, there are Israeli Arabs that vote for Zionist parties. Too. Many, many, Very by hundreds, large. by thousands. Ah, and but this, this is the Likud. The, not only to the Likud, all, no, also, to, also, also to the ultra, ultra orthodox, orthodox and also, yeah. like Shas, for example. But this is very easy to explain because traditionally in Israel, the most important uh, ministry for Arabs is the interior one. Because he is the responsible on the budget for the Arab locality, localities. So if, if, a, if a religious person, somebody who has Kippa like Dani, or somebody is an orthodox for like Arya Dei, for example, is sitting in the Ministry of Interior, you are voting for him because you know that if you vote for him, he will take care of you. The most prominent example was in 1988. Two months before the elections, Arya Dei, who by then, Time was the general director of the Ministry of Interior decided together with its minister to, uh, pro, to uh, declare on Umel Fahem as a city. Now you know one that if you became a city in Israel, the number of budget automatically increased. Yeah. So they got the money for, for, for Shas and they voted for Shas. And if you check the belt in Umel Fahem in 1988, you see that Shas uh, has received at that time one full mandate in Umul Fahem, which is amazing. Well, but I that happened also, traditionally, so for so many years. I noticed also that in the budget, Mansour Abbas gave 30 million US dollars to um, the UTJ, to the Haredi party, from his budget allocation. So obviously that's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. um, another question we have here by one of the listeners is, they're concerned about how much access uh, Mansour Abbas would have to military confidential information. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, I, can I call Bennett for a second? <laughs> oh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. If I need to assess, to make my assessment, 
It doesn't. It doesn't. Because even if you establish the committee of uh, the foreign and, uh, and, and security committee within the Knesset, and our, there are Arabs in this, in this uh, conf, uh, committee, the real discussions or the real uh, confidential materials are not presenting there. In the committee. By the subcommittee, only in the subcommittee. Ah. And since 1948, there were no Arabs in the subcommittee. The, by the way, I don't care. I, I, I'm not sure that Mansour Abbas is really care about it. Ah, that's what I was going to say. Maybe it suits Mansour Abbas more not to be in the committee anyway, or not I, to get I, the information. I, I'm not sure that he's so care about it. Well, and, and, uh, as long as the, the, the situation between Israel and the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip or, or and in the West Bank is, 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 is not escalating, for, for him, it's perfect. He can move on with his civil affairs program. That's okay. Right. Okay. Uh, just to remind people that if they want to ask a question, they can put it in the chat. There are no questions waiting there at the moment that I can see. Um, so I want to go back to another question, and maybe because I think I didn't get the answer to the question I was uh, hoping to get or looking for. But, uh, when I was talking about, you, you, you made a very strong point that we can give all the civil rights to whoever as long as we maintain the power. And we maintain the power with a, um, a majority, a, a large majority. So how do we maintain that majority and not allow the Jewishness, if you like, of the state of Israel to erode? How we maintain majority? Yeah. We did I it by several, by several uh, ways since 1948. First of all, most of the Arabs who left the country, either by their own will or they had to flee, will, 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 they, they, had, they, they never had the chance to come back. Right. They, they remain refugees. Second, we encouraging uh, Jews to have babies. You're a yeah. dentist, Danny is a dentist. I can tell you as a person who lives in Israel that I have five children, I have two sets of twins. Mansour Abbas is also a dentist. So I, I, made, I made five. Five is okay Mabuto. for a second. Mansour Abbas is okay. also a dentist. <laughs> five is okay for a second old person like me. I'm not an right. orthodox and I'm not a religious person, but, but, but I really can't answer that. The, you know, the certain things that we did that we promoted Aliyah from what we call from from some form of Soviet Union and elsewhere. So the the all the old focus of we are losing our uh, majority in Israel uh, on, on a scale of seven decades never happened. It, it never okay. happened. It never happened. It never happened. It never happened. It never happened. Excellent. One of the problems that we face in the diaspora, or that looks funny from the diaspora, or ironical. I mean. Self-interest is bringing many parties together, like the Abraham Accords and so on and so forth. But it almost seems like uh, the cooperation between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews, between even the surrounding Arab countries in Israel, is of a greater level than amongst many diaspora Jews to Israel, um, who are looking at uh, things in a completely unrealistic way. But nevertheless, um, you know, trying to, um, in a way, uh, be defenders of the Arabs that the Arabs don't want defending because they're concerned about their daily lives. Do you see a drift or do, in any of the work that you do, do you do anything vis-a-vis -vis the diaspora where you see a drift between large segments of the diaspora, which is completely contrary to what's the process of, I guess, you know, shared or common interest in the Middle East? And folks, whilst Giddy, uh, that's, that's, that's while that, Daddy's thinking, Please put more questions in. That's sorry. That's no an, that's 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 a, that's a hard, that's maybe the hardest question that you see that you ask me so far. Okay. I, I can tell you, I can tell you from my own experience that if you look back to ten years ago, to 2011, let's say December 2010, when Arab Spring events has uh, had sparked in Tunisia, and then. Uh, then spread all, all over the Middle East to other states. You see that the, the region, I don't know how, the, how does it look from the diaspora, but I can tell you how does it look from here. And I just, I just, I just came back a week ago from, from a very important conference in the United States. I can tell you I, how things look in, in the United States. But I, I, I'll tell you a story. I went, to the, I went to the conference two weeks ago and last Sunday I was standing in, in front of the audience and I told them, 
this story. You know why, why did I come this year to the United States? Here's the story. I wrote a book about the internal rift between PA and FAT and Hamas between 2007 and, two, uh, and 2017, trying to, to explore or to analyze how come two national movements, one secular, one religious, with the same vision and same ethos, trying to expel the Jews from here, has, had, has, has, had failed so many times uh, to, to compromise and to, to solve the rift. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and my answer was that over the years, they, they have developed different, different vision. Now, I'm telling you the story because every time when I read something that somebody in the United States write about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you see that you, there is no, this is not a research study. Most of the time it is a position paper plus recommendation, do this and don't do this. <clears throat> Why? Because the Arab Spring has exposed to the world, probably to uh, also for you as Jewish in the diaspora, as Jews in the diaspora, that the, most of the, the scholarly in the, in the last decade is focusing on three major things. One is the global jihad threats, which is a global one. The second one is the, 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 the humanitarian question of the, of the Syrian refugees who fled from Syria and nobody is really taking care of them. The third one is the un, un, probably a, the intractable conflict between Shia and Sunnah, which is sparked by in a minute. The, and, and, the, and, and I'm telling you this to answer you that we cannot talk about an Arab unity community. There is no such a thing. Even you, if you are a dentist in Melbourne or in Sydney, or it doesn't matter what you do in your life elsewhere in the world, we cannot talk about Arab as a one conglomerate. It never was, and it's not, and it will probably will never be. Look at Lebanon. Lebanon had 18 different sects, 18 different sects. They are falling apart day by day economically, and they cannot combine their forces to, to save Lebanon. Look at Yemen after 10 years of a war, yeah. Syria, Libya. Look at the Shiites in Saudi Arabia. I just finished writing a book about the, the, the question of nationalism in Saudi Arabia, if, they, if, if there's a poll. What is what is to be a KSA nationalistic? If you want the, if, when, when the book it will be, it, when the book will be here, if you want a copy, I can send you. It, it, you want to, Danny? What is to be? What is to be? What is to be an Arab? What is an Arab? What is an Arab? Do you have to be a Muslim in order to be an Arab? So what would the Christian Arab we say? What about the Druze and so on and so on? So there, I'm glad that we have this conversation, not because of Mansour Abbas, because we are living in a world that is changing all the time and changes are occurring all the time. That means that even people, even a person like Mansour Abbas, that is basically and historically and traditionally is a religious person, realizes that there is no chance now to put any caliphate here. Wow. So may, it doesn't mean that the vision is not here, is doomed. Right. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying is that in order to, to to get closer to the vision, you have to start with something. And he broke the glass of ceiling for Arabs, yeah. telling them we, are, we cannot work only in the Knesset. We cannot make protests all the time. We have to do something different. And this different thing is to be within the coalition. And if you want to say, uh, I say to the audience here, that it's like getting into the, to a lab, try to make such an experience, this is an experience. We are making a test now. Okay. And there's a okay. chance that in four years time from now, when we talk over the WhatsApp or Zoom, or, or if you be in Israel or I come to Australia, never mind. You say, you remember the conversation of 2021? It was all rubbish. Or not? So we'll see how the experiment turns out. On my part, I want to, personally, I just want to thank you very much. Um, I found it fascinating and good to hear somebody who uh, really understands that situation. And I'd just like to hand back to Danny Lamb to then introduce Paul to wind it up. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Ron. And in a moment, I will hand over to Paul. But just before I do that, I want to acknowledge a few people are on, on the screen. One of them is Adrian Trigger, who's the Director of Donor Relations of REL University. And he and Bobby Brown are floating around uh, London in the United Kingdom. Um, and Bobby is the Vice President of External Affairs. 
So I want to acknowledge them. I'm delighted that they're there. And I want to acknowledge uh, one of the founding uh, supporters of Ariel in Australia, Tom Danos, um, who is, goes on the moniker of GD. Down below there, I don't know what GD means, Tom, but you'll tell me one day. And Harriet Warlow Shield, who's done a lot of the legal work in, 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 in setting us up. Um, and, you know, and doing, done a great job. I want to acknowledge uh, three people who put in questions. And the first one was David Adler, who is one of our co-organisations co uh, uh, working to, for this evening tonight. And he runs the very successful Australian Jewish Association. He's sitting right in the middle of the screen, David Adler. I want to acknowledge David Prince, who asked a question, and Harriet Warlow Shield, who asked a question. And um, I want to also acknowledge Henry Greener from the Shtick, um, who we may speak to about uh, further promotion. Thank you all for your work. And I want to acknowledge Alex Goodman, who's the head of Friends of Likud uh, in Australia, uh, one of the uh, sponsoring organisations. And I want to identify the man with the, with the black moustache, Steve Liebwich, who's over in Perth from who is associated with AJAC. And now I'd like to hand over to Paul Nayland. Paul, over to you, Thanks, mate. Danny. So yeah, really on, on behalf of the Australian Friends of Australia University, I just wanted to express my deep thanks to Gary for that fascinating talk. You know, uh, Israeli politics is complex at the best of times. And you've shed a lot of light onto what is not, you know, not well known area of that, uh, that aspect of politics. So I found it fascinating and thought provoking. And the trend that you presented is, is fascinating and, and hopefully it can peacefully continue. Also wanna thank Ron for his time in uh, moderating and you know, putting you to the task with some tough questions. Uh, there's a lot of people behind the scenes who've worked hard to make this happen. So thank you to Abigail from Ariel, but a, a really big thank you to Ilana She's down at Kingston, but she goes by Alana Silva, who's our PR person. She has worked relentlessly to design and organize and encourage people to attend. So really a, a huge thank you to her. And also really a big thank you for all of you who've taken the time out of your evening generally to attend. And hopefully it's been interesting. As, uh, as Danny said, I'm actually in Israel at the moment. So I'm lucky enough to be here. And that's a picture of Ariel University in my background. So it makes it a little bit more, more real for you. And I was also lucky enough to visit the university for a day. Adrian took me around and showed me so much of what's happening there. And it really was an inspiring and interesting day. Uh, I took away, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but Ariel is probably what building the state of Israel was like. That's what I felt it's like. It's this. University is a lot bigger than people imagine. It's nearly 18,000 students, but it's brand new. It's like a startup university. It's got fantastic aspirations. It punches above its weight. Uh, it's really like building something. And you know, picking up on things on Ron and what's happening there, Ariel is like a microcosm of Israeli society. Yes, it's in the Shomron, but it represents everybody. Everybody, and it's all about you know promoting uh, development of the region and greater Israel. So you know people probably don't realize there are nearly 2,000 Arab students there. There's students of religious, not religious. Um, you know, someone visited. They said they're even excited to see you know girls in pants from Tel Aviv. Uh, it is a fantastic place. The other thing that I, I really took away was the passion and the dedication of the staff part of that building, and you can see it in Gadi, who's an enthusiastic, knowledgeable expert in his area. Um, so, you know, what we've done is we've got this new organization, Australian Friends of Ariel University. Our mission is to raise awareness. So this is the first of a series of webinars that we'll be holding with people from Ariel who can share their expertise with us. So I encourage you to attend those that follow and you know, also refer them to your friends. We will aim to try and encourage some uh, strategic partnerships with academic institutions in Australia. And, and of course, 
obviously, ultimately, we want to raise some money to help the university. So we have active Sydney and Melbourne chapters. And if you want to get involved, please reach out to us. If you want any more information, if you're in Israel and you wanted to visit the university, it's a, it's a really fascinating uh, visit, uh, particularly the wine, because you get to do some quite unique wine tasting. But there are many, many very uh, interesting aspects, and it's a great day out. Uh, so lastly, again, I just want to thank everybody who put their time, Gadi and Ron, Danny for the introduction, and yep, to everybody for attending. So have a great evening.